Today is the first day of the July-August 1986 retreat. Something was not quite clear to somebody last night in what was said about the eyes. The person said, what at mealtime or during work, if I have to look, do I look down? Please not to make a problem out of this posture of the eyes. Obviously, when there's something to look, the bowl and the ladle and dishing it out into the into the little bowl to look, not to keep the eyes down when we'll have the soup in the lap <laughs> on the toes. And during work if one doesn't look at the floor that one is cleaning one will miss the dirt. possible not to make a problem out of anything. Problem comes when ideas are opposed, new ideas are in opposition to old ideas. But if one actually looks and enters into the situation and sees it for what it is, then there's no problem if the ideas don't interfere what should be rather than what is. Walking down the stairs, of course, if one is not familiar with the stairs, one looks where the last step is. looking at the steps underfoot, does one really see them? Not the idea of a step, but this actual thing and the foot touching it and the next foot about to touch the next step. One may never have done it once because the mind is constantly occupy with dreams and fantasies of what it should be doing, that it should be attentive, and meanwhile missing a step. Usually at the beginning of a retreat, during the first talk, we we talk about listening to a talk, how to listen to a talk. You may have heard this many times before, and that is as always a danger when one has heard something many times before. There's a thought that comes up immediately, I, I know what she's going to say. I've heard it, and therefore there's no listening. Either one listens to the memory of what was said and compares it, compares it to the words that are coming out now, or one thinks I can skip that and wait till she says something that I haven't heard before. But see, the important thing here is not the listening to words. Whether one has heard them before or whether they are new, find out if one can actually see within oneself, look within oneself, to make the words real, to go beyond the words and see what is being talked about and whether it is actually so, to verify within oneself. Through the directness of one's 
looking and listening and insight, which no one can do for one. It can only happen here. It can't happen from there and taking over and doing it for me. And for that immediacy and directness of, of listening and looking to take place, there has to be an openness. If one is tied to any kind of idea, background, belief, system, there is immediately an unfreedom to look openly without any position, no standpoint. That's what appears to be so arduous because we're wedded, we're in love with our standpoints, with our positions. Consciously or unconsciously, awares or unawares, we're holding on to ideas and opinions, beliefs, superstitions. which is a blind spot in, in the mind. At that spot where there is the, <coughs> where there's the attachment, the belief, the conviction, the conclusion, what I know is so, I've, I've experienced it myself and now I know it is so, at that point there is no, no openness, no newness and freshness to, to perceive. for the first time, freshly. Memory comes to mind, having been in Poland once, where people take their cows, usually single cows, for grazing. Cows are tied with a rope and there's a stick to which the cow is attached and that stick is put into the ground and in that circle that the string allows the cow to make around that post the cow can graze but it can go no further. It tries to go further it is pulled back by a string and pull. And all the attachments and fixations, opinions, being tied to belief systems that we have, acts in the same way. We can go so far and no further. This tremendous belief system in being me, a separate individual entity, and I don't mean the body, which is what it is, with all its physiological and anatomical and hereditary idiosyncrasies, peculiarities, specialties. <clears throat> but the conviction that within this body dwells the I, the me, that can control and shape and develop and enlarge and decrease. <coughs> that is different from others. <coughs> that deep, deep conviction that there is this separate entity blinds us to open perception of what actually is going on. to listening, to a talk where what is said may run counter to one's ideas or one may feel threatened by what is being said. This entity feels threatened. 
therefore it doesn't want to look. It, it protects itself with thought processes, memory or anticipation processes, or condemnation. All thought processes which are observable. They're not being postulated out of an idea. They can be observed by each one of us because we all share the same mind processes, the same brain processes. So listening here, can an openness come into being? That at least for the duration of the talk, or whatever length of time it's possible, suspend what one knows and believes in and wants to happen, or doesn't want to happen. And openly receives and looking at the same time, whether this is so. Looking within while listening, is that possible? Of course it's possible. If the energies don't dart here and there and everywhere, if the energies gather in the listening, in the openness of the listening. Then if something strikes one as being not so, no, this is, she's off, she, that, 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 that's her opinion then please bring it up in a meeting. I truly welcome people challenging what is being said. I don't want to remember what I said verbatim, <coughs> but we can start afresh looking at what is unclear or what seems to be false or needs to be explored further. So don't feel that you have to, to swallow or uh, accept what is being said and there's nothing to be accepted. It's to be looked at, tested, verified, questioned, either alone or together. That's what meetings are for and that's what sittings are for. To question alone and together. grappling with it, coming to, to insight. Oh, what happens in this mind? So one is not eternally, perpetually fooled by it, tricked by it, under the guise of true teachings or true instructions. Sometimes people tell me that they're tired during the talk, that they doze off for periods of time. May have many reasons, may have, have been, may have worked hard before the retreat. People here and staff do an incredible amount of work preparing for the retreat and people coming to a retreat do a tremendous amount of work preparing for leaving the office, the house, the home, the family. And then the heat last night, the rooms are small, one may not have slept. So there may be real tiredness and during a talk, the mind goes to sleep. Maybe the body too, one may almost fall over. <laughs> Nobody's ever fallen over, <laughs> fallen over. Well, it almost gets to that, and then one wakes up from one's own tipping forward. There are, after the, after the work period, there is a, a rest period, and uh, to use that, particularly before the talk, to get some rest, that may help to be more awake during the, the listening. The listening talking, it's a, it's a, undivided process. 
and one may find in the course of the retreat that there is more energy to stay awake. If one finds one has fallen asleep then, and, and comes to just to, to pick it up right there, if one and then engages in recriminations against oneself, how, how I shouldn't be asleep at this point and how poor at that moment one is asleep again with recrimination, with thoughts, ancient conditioned lines that one feeds oneself about how bad one is or how good one is or could be. It's so useless just to, when one wakes up, can there just be that and listening and, and no extra, no comments on what has happened. Also, I believe that the talks are available for somebody who wants to, to listen to it. They, they are being taped. So if one feels there was something that one hasn't understood or had, has just barely missed or missed, write a note to Stu or Dave and maybe a <coughs> tape can be made available. I may be wrong in this, so find out. To sit during a talk, find the most comfortable, least pain and discomfort producing position, if there is such a thing. So that you don't have to, to battle and contend with this physical discomfort during listening. It, can, it, it, it absorbs energy to, to struggle with the, with the pain. Actually, one never needs to struggle with pain. Pain, if it's there, it's there. Can it be felt without any resistance? Not a shadow of resistance. And these shadows are there. They have to be detected. Thoughts of, why does, I, does it have to hurt right now? And why is it so bad? And others seem to have less of it. And I know this is going to get worse. All of these are resistance to what is actually there. Can it be felt without all of our customary reactions? But even that does take energy. And if there's no pain, then the, the energy is there for the attention. So find a bench, a chair, or posture that gives the least problems. And also, if you need to change posture. It's not like a round of sitting. You can change your, your legs or do whatever is necessary to relieve pain. But in changing the posture, can it happen so quietly that one minimally disturbs the, the silence, the people around one? It is possible if there is a caring attention given, not just how the leg is being changed, but also to the people left and right, front and back. We're not separate from each other. That, that is seen when there is this open, listening care. I think I mentioned briefly last night that in giving these talks and speaking there's no image here of being a teacher. Is it possible that there be no image made of this person here as being a teacher? It is, a, it is a hindrance. You may contest that and say, no, to me it's a great help to know I have a teacher, I have a good teacher. But this is image-making in the mind. And attachment goes with it. Attachment, so easily it slides into some kind of a worship adulation with all its side effects of 
competition, my teacher versus your teacher. And it is so totally irrelevant to the work of looking for oneself. Something is being said, but who says it is so irrelevant to looking and seeing whether this is so? That is the only crucial thing here. Not what the person is like who does the talking and comparisons. And attachment. With that, the work on oneself stops and a new occupation sets in, which we much rather do. Being occupied in our minds with our teachers or uh, whoever. It can be fun and zest, battling or agreeing, or, but it, it is, doesn't bring understanding of why one needs the, such a person, such an attachment. And to go to the bottom of this need, one's feelings of insufficiency, inadequacy, helplessness, not good enoughness. The fear to face that head on, directly, seeing that, being that, without any escape into a teacher who will rectify it for one, or the relationship that will take care of that. So can one enter into this work, into this listening and looking without being anybody, not being a student or a seeker, a spiritual person. All these identities we love, we crave and we cling to. Seeing the images, the identities that we have created for ourselves and are always ever willing to add to, <coughs> drop one, get another one or two. Identity. Is it possible to sit here, listening, looking, attending, and not being anybody? Not being anybody special. Not knowing who one is when there is no image that supports one's knowledge of oneself. It gets scary because we're so accustomed to to being something all the time, producing ourselves, projecting an image. We've been, we've been taught that since we were little. We've been told what we are, good and bad, and clever, intelligent, better than baby brother. <laughs> Gifted, popular and unpopular. good-looking, bad-looking, slim, fat, all these identities we have. And they totally prevent us from finding out what we are. This moment. What are we this moment when all identities, all of them, the whole, the totality of it is put aside? <coughs> 
Then is there a new sprout of an identity? I'm nothing. Now I'm nothing. It immediately can become an idea. Now I'm really practicing as nobody. And is it an idea? And can that idea be let go of? Without any substitution, without really knowing what one is? What are we when there are no words inside, no pictures inside? Has it ever happened? Can one listen to the sound of the wind without being a listener? Listen. The totality of it, we'll name it here because we're communicating. The leaves, the airplane, the birds, the cough, feeling the knees on the buttocks, in the back maybe, or on the shoulders, the coolness of the breeze. Can it all be there exactly as it is with no evaluating listener in the middle? Thoughts come up, I can't do it, I can't do it. Can this immediately be seen as thought and what impact it has on the emotions, on the feelings, and then there's no listening? It's not a matter of being able to do it or not being able to do it. Either attention is there or it isn't there. And if the thought comes up, I must be attentive, I want to have this attention, that's thought. And it's not attention. Do you see that? Listening right now, chee 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 chee. Is that an effort? Some rustling in the room, feeling of the shirt on the arms, <coughs> an ankle on the, on the mat, is feeling that, is that an effort? Does one have to say, I must feel that before it's felt? If one says, I must feel it, then one is preoccupied with what one must do. And that precludes this openness of feeling, which is there when the preoccupation with what I must do is quiet, in abeyance, or dissolved completely. Usually in talks, things are brought up which people have brought up in meetings because most of the time what is brought up in meetings is not an individual, personal thing only. We talked about it yesterday, it may start this way, but fundamentally it is human problems, our own problems that are being discussed. So very often a question <coughs> lends, lends itself well to being gone into broadly and deeply here in the talk. I want to say at the outset that this is not done to 
commit any indiscretion. The, who, whoever said this, this is never revealed. Actually, something comes to mind in this connection, and it is since that incident that I have mentioned this at the beginning of talks that questions will be brought up discreetly in, in talks. <coughs> One time after I had done this, mentioned something somebody had said and as part of a talk, person coming to a meeting after the talk told me that when this thing was brought up, he felt terribly hurt, he actually felt betrayed, this is how he put it. And I felt very bad myself when I heard him talk, but he was, I didn't interrupt him. So he said, in, in the midst of this feeling of, of, of betrayal and the anger that arose, there was suddenly an insight that what this whole concern was about was an image of himself. And with this insight, so he reported, the whole problem dissolved and he had a good laugh. And when I after he stopped talking, when I said I was sorry that I had done this, he said, don't be sorry, it was an image. It was just an image. And if we observe this in our day-to-day, moment-to-moment living, what is it that gets hurt when we feel insulted or slighted, interfered with? Watch it, observe it, get to, the, get to the bottom of it. If not every time, it is an image of myself that is not being respected. And question then, what if there was no image? Would there be this hurt? I had no image of myself. Could anybody hurt me? Or would then be this openness to hear what the person is saying, to hear where he's coming from or she's coming from? Whether maybe... He has something, she has something, he has something worth looking at. Or one sees the person is in anguish or irritated, frustrated, or wants to take something out on somebody. And it's not taken personally. It's actually a feeling of compassion for the person who is lashing out. But that can only happen if there's no image here. There may be an image that gets hurt and immediately the image, I must be compassionate and feel compassionate with this person. Then it's not a spontaneous listening and looking. Then one is following a path, a learned, trained path. But that is not compassion. Compassion cannot be learned. What is learned is not compassion. Compassion is there in natural abundance when there is no self-protection and self-concern and self-occupation. Compassion, incidentally, not meaning supporting the other, comforting him or her, but seeing compassionately what is going on in the human mind. (coughs) 
and allowing the response, the right appropriate response to come out of that seeing, not out of an idea of what I should be doing for this person. I always miss this, sometimes very slightly, but it misses. Because one isn't completely there to take, to, to, to feel and be the whole situation. Not only, only that reality creates the appropriate response, which may be no response. It is also an appropriate response at times. No response, just an openness of being there without knowing what to say, because words don't come. Usually the words that come are our deeply ingrained habitual reactions. And the more sensitive and aware one becomes, when one is amazed how quickly a habitual response is out, a habitual reaction, one hasn't even wanted to, to, to react this way. And thinking it over later, I didn't want to say that, and yet there it was. Because there was no attention at that moment. Attention later is no good as far as the reaction is concerned. That's out. And yet, one can see the whole thing in retrospect, but maybe the damage has been done. One has hurt oneself and another. So in, in a long, silent retreat, is it possible to become very familiar with the strength of habitual reactions and question where they're coming from? I don't mean going back analytically in time to find the cause. If the mind wants to do that, well, let it do it and, and, and watch. But the cause, is, the cause is right here. It may not be the original cause, but it's no different from the original cause, that which causes to react instantly at something that annoys one or frightens one. It's always, always me in some way. My rights, my ways, my this or that. I'm not saying that any kind of a judgment, it's factual, it can be discovered to be so. And if that's discovered, a universal fact has been discovered, not just my personal suffering from, uh, from ego. It's universal. a long, deeply wired path in the brain, and the brain connecting to the, the organs, the muscles. Reactions have been formed and reoccur along the same wired path. I think modern electronics, computer science doesn't speak about wiring anymore. And it's not wires running there, it's a different kind of a technology. That's the same type of process where something that's laid down as a pattern keeps responding as a pattern if it's triggered. And each response that has happened thickens or deepens the pattern. That has been physiologically demonstrated. Synapses were brain cells and um, nerve cells connect with motor and other uh, conductors, I'm not expert on this at all, become thickened. 
So the, the likelihood of the response occurring again is a little bit greater because it's occurred once, twice, over and over. And then afterwards one can say, I, I'm sorry. And there's nothing wrong with saying I'm sorry. But that saying I'm sorry does not thin this connection. <clears throat> it's only when, when attention is there at the moment that response wants to happen. And it's seen. And all the desire to have that pattern run as a tremendous... Uh, it's an autonomous thing almost, that the pattern wants to repeat itself. And there's a certain release in it, a certain gratification. To, to make an angry response as gratification in that I think all of us can verify that. At the moment, if there is a tension to, to not slip into this current of gratification moving with a pattern of a thousand repetitions, but looking at the whole thing. The energies gathered in the looking and the listening and the awareness. Then that pattern will not repeat itself at that moment. It will, I don't know, find out. Whether a a word that comes up, it may get stuck right before the vocal cords spit it out. One sees how, how, how useless it is, how, and how it is creating the same problem over and over and over and over again. And if one sees that, it doesn't, happen to ha it doesn't have to happen. It can sweetly Discontinue. Sweetly meaning it doesn't have to have any force, not the force of I must not be this way, I must be otherwise. That is, this is another pattern. And it does not disengage. It only substitutes. I must or I must not, I must not be angry, I must become a mellow person. These intentions and, and goals have nothing to do with change, with dissolution of an old pattern. An old pattern can only dissolve if it's seen in its totality. How it comes up, how it affects everyone, including oneself. We are everyone. <coughs> What affects us affects everybody else. What affects you affects me. We're interconnected. Share the same consciousness. Actually, what I had wanted to talk about this morning, and it's already been approached, is this matter of setting goals for oneself, which one person brought up. Don't I need goals? Or is it wrong to have goals? I have them all the time, this person said. Let us not decide or be concerned with whether it is right to have them, whether it's wrong to have them, but what happens when we are occupied with a goal in the mind. Taking the example we just worked out here of being angry and afterwards feeling, feeling bad, either feeling remorseful, regretful, or beginning to justify oneself, well, I had a righteous anger. I was right in being angry. And then maybe remembering some words one had heard, has heard or read. Or maybe one has taken a precept not to be angry. And 
And then this goal being set up, not to be angry. He used to participate years ago in some repentance and resolution um, ceremonies of some kind. New Year's at that particular place they were held and all the resolutions that everybody voiced, what they were going to do and not going to do during the new year, not to be angry, was very often heard. Resolve to control anger. And human beings have resolved to control anger, not just in contemporary resolution and confession ceremonies, but for thousands of years. Every religion has some kind of thing in there. Not every, but a lot of religions. Not to be angry. At least not at certain people. There's always some outside group where it may be all right to vent one's anger, one's righteous anger in that case. So what about this goal of not becoming angry, of, of, of controlling anger? Can one, if one has these goals of, it may not be anger, it may be to become a better person, more peaceful, or, or free from fear, we're talking about the goal, and what is a goal as far as the mind is concerned, the brain? Isn't it an idea? Please look at it thoroughly. Whether right now to resolve not to become angry again, or to be more peaceful, or not to be afraid, to become a better person, as it is being said here and looked at. It's an idea, isn't it? And if one preoccupy if the mind is preoccupied with this goal, is it free to look at anger? Or does it necessarily need to control that immediately because of the goal? And anger that is being suppressed, controlled, is not being looked at. It's just the substitution of one pattern for another, or the suppression of one pattern by another pattern. It's not the freedom from patterns. It's not the diminution of the, of the synapses that connect all of our ideas with our emotional and, and sensing faculties. <coughs> as far as just sitting quietly, if the goal comes up and one is busying, the mind is busying itself thinking about the goal, maybe repeating it. Is there the openness of awareness to what's happening right this moment? Or is the mind already divided? Either completely oblivious to what is going on or sort of um, oscillating back and forth between partially attending to what's happening, partially busy with the goal. And the conflict of that, the division of it. See, one can never be not angry in the future. 
think about that. But the future is thought, projection. Question is, as anger arises, now can it be seen so thoroughly that it dissolves right now, not in the future. The future never arrives. It's always now. We will end here for today.